this afternoon with uh, last lecture from, uh, I mean, last te lecture of today with uh, uh, Herman Ferlinda's lecture. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, every uh, lecture I kind of start li still with a little bit giving you uh, a bit of the big picture and, and the motivation. Uh, so indeed, sort of part of what uh, I've been building up uh, is partly introduce um, some of the structure that a two-dimensional uh, conformal field theory has, or, or, or more generally, um, indeed, if we talk about holography in lower dimensions, there's by now a, a, a structure that, that, that um, uh, sort of summarizes a little bit of how holography works. Um, so let me still, uh, maybe paradigm is a little bit of a, a heavy word, but it's sort of a, a, a way in which we're thinking about it is the following, is that there is sort of some theory, uh, which is the thing we would like to understand, uh, which is, uh, it could be a string theory, uh, and indeed, let me call it string theory. Um, and it has all kinds of detail, uh, and it allows you to do computations, uh, and it will indeed include quantum gravity, uh, but it will also include all kinds of microscopic information. Uh, and if you were to be able to uh, compute exactly in this theory and you start asking what is the spectrum of excitations in this theory, it will include also black holes and, and it will have a discrete um, energy spectrum uh, and you can understand gravity simply as a, a low energy mode of the, of the string theory. Uh, and then ADS-CFT, or at least holography, uh, sort of at the microscopic level, uh, would give you here some kind of very detailed um, holographic CFT. Which also has all kinds of micro uh, structure. Uh, and then uh, there is some kind of a a exact uh, duality between these two systems. Uh, and again, the number of examples of this is, is relatively uh, uh, short. Uh, again, we have n equals 4 Young Mills, if we go indeed up to 3 plus 1 dimensions. And here we have strings on ADS 5 times less 5. Um, uh, but then it's still a little bit mysterious of how um, uh, sort of this dictionary of why, why it works. Uh, but now it turns out actually that, that there's sort of a, a way of thinking about um, uh, holographic CFTs, where indeed, again, uh, let me still draw that picture, where we have some detailed spectrum uh, with funny, uh, yeah, uh, irregularities, but still with s s universal properties. Uh, and then there is actually, in, in many cases, um, uh, some kind of universal um, low energy field theory, um, uh, which is sort of the, uh, let's, uh, the soft mode, uh, uh, and I can call it uh, an effective uh, uh, field theory. Um, and indeed, in the case of two-dimensional holography, um, the soft mode is associated with the conformal transformations. Uh, and, and actually, there was a, um, a, a description that I gave uh, of the conformal transformations um, that, that will allow you to start understanding what this soft mode really is. Um, um, in terms of either these complex uh, coordinate transformations or in terms of actually this field that I wrote down earlier, which I called sigma. But let me maybe not go into the details of this yet. But the idea is that um, the way you arrive at this theory, this is sort of a universal theory. This is a, a more specialized theory. And this is going to describe basically the collective, or at least the, the, the universal, the averaged properties, if you wish, it could be an ensemble of theories that look like that. But in this case, the spectrum kind of looks like that, where the, the spectrum is continuous in this theory, because this theory actually doesn't really know about all the microphysical structure that sits here. So the details of the spectrum are shared between here and there. Uh, and again, this, this dictionary is, is somewhat mysterious. You do computations here, and you compare them with computations there, and they kind of often sort of give you the same answer. It turns out that uh, there's a similar kind of low energy theory as you can write down here, which is essentially, um, let me call it just pure uh, uh, quantum gravity. Uh, 
Now, this looks a little bit uh, uh, suspicious uh, because quantum gravity is notoriously hard to sort of define, uh, and we don't know how to quantize the Einstein action in a way that gives us a, a consistent uh, a quantum field theory. At least we don't know how to do that in three plus one dimensions. But in two and uh, in three, in two plus one dimensions, so in three total dimensions, or in one plus one dimensions, there are actually gravity theories that want there are, that are actually purely soluble systems. Um, uh, uh, and so low dimensional in, in, in 2D and in 3D, pure quantum gravity actually exists. Uh, and in the same way as that we're here, we're basically going uh, from a, a description um, uh, that has sort of less universal properties, and we just go down here uh, to extract the universal properties. Uh, we can do the same thing here. There are all kinds of structure here that, that is special to the string theory and the microscopic theory, uh, but this pure quantum gravity that describes sort of what happens uh, at, 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 uh, more generically, again, is universal uh, uh, when it comes to uh, capturing at least the gravity of that particular theory. Uh, and then it turns out that this thing here is, is, a, is a mapping uh, that still can exist, uh, and this mapping is almost um, manifest. This duality. Uh, and it turns out that these gravity theories are such, uh, and this is special to three dimensions to some extent and two dimensions, uh, because gravity in two plus one dimensions for sure, uh, and also in gravity in two dimensions as we'll see, uh, does not have any local gravitons, it doesn't have propagating modes, um, uh, and it's therefore a, a bit more immediate that you can capture it completely in terms of this soft mode. Um, but indeed, this thing lives uh, indeed in, in, in higher dimensions, so the, 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 uh, yeah, if this is uh, d-dimensional, this thing lives in d plus one dimensions. Uh, so therefore, at least to some extent, holography, when you, when you project it down to this particular level, is no longer mysterious. It's something that you can actually honestly derive. Um, uh, and, and that's slightly surprising, perhaps, uh, because uh, this thing here uh, is often what we call a strong, uh, weak duality. Uh, meaning, if this thing is weakly coupled, is this, if this thing is weakly curved, uh, then the n equals 4 yam mills theory that would sit here would be very strongly coupled. So in that respect, this duality is actually pretty hard to understand from the point of view of the description of this theory. Uh, and you have to go to strong coupling to go to weakly coupled, on the gravity side, to go to weak, weakly coupled young mills. So here it's strong weak, uh, whereas here it's, 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 it's weak weak. Uh, because it turns out that here, of course, you go to a more weakly coupled description if the curvature of your space is not too big. So the, the curvature becomes less curved. Uh, whereas here, uh, it turns out that in that limit, uh, so I introduced this quantity that I called the central charge. Effectively, what you're doing is you're taking the central charge to be very large. It turns out that the central charge is capturing basically the, the quantity n of the n equals 4 young mills theory, if you wish or the central charge of the CFT, this thing becomes large. Uh, and it turns out that the effective dynamics of this soft mode is precisely becoming weakly coupled in that particular limit. So you get a mapping between a weakly coupled system and a weakly coupled system. Uh, just sort of to give you a bit of uh, an outline of some of the things that I'll be talking about. So if, if we do this in, in, in uh, three dimensions, uh, then you get indeed pure quantum gravity in three plus one dimensions, which I may say a few words about. If you do it in two dimensions, you get a theory that's called, uh, let me immediately do use the, the, the abbreviation, it's called JT gravity. Uh, in three dimensions, I should still, let me still write down the action in three dimensions. Pure gravity in, in three dimensions would be indeed having three coordinates and then just need having the Einstein action with a cosmological constant. Um, it turns out that if you take this action uh, and you do it in three dimensions, you still get a theory that's 
somewhat non-trivial, except that it indeed doesn't have any gravitons, uh, but it still has a, a description in terms of uh, just a metric. If I would take this action in two dimensions, I would get something completely trivial because this turns out to be a topological invariant. Uh, it's basically going into the Euler character. Uh, and then you need to do something else. You need to introduce this other field that's called then the dilaton. Uh, and then instead of writing down this action, uh, we, we, we do, uh, by the way, this would probably be like that. Like that. Um, something like, uh, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, something like that. Um, so this is the JT gravity action uh, where we've introduced an additional field which is called the dilaton field. Uh, and the equation of motion of the dilaton field um, is that the metric is constant negative curvature. Um, uh, uh, but that turns out to be the theory that, that fits into this particular um, description. Um, uh, uh, and and, and I'll, I'll explain at least uh, more about this particular mapping, uh, because it turns out that in the in the in the two-dimensional case, uh, the theory that sits here uh, is a theory that uh, only people started thinking about a little bit um, more recently. Um, uh, so so here I was saying in 2D again. So if I now do 1D because now I'm in, in, in one dimension lower uh, than on that side, uh, I get a theory uh, that I claim is indeed manifestly equivalent to uh, dilaton gravity. Uh, and that theory uh, is described, uh, so it's a quantum mechanical theory. Uh, and it's described by having um, a single time variable. Uh, it will have a, a pre-coefficient, uh, which I'll call um, big C, I guess. Um, uh, and it will have an action, uh, which is actually given by this object that I had before. I will have a variable uh, that's a function uh, tau of t. Uh, so I will have um, a, a function of a one-dimensional one time. Uh, and then I can write down uh, the, the, the Schwarzschild derivative between tau and t. So I have this thing that I had before, um, uh, where uh, the Schwarzschild derivative, uh, again, is defined uh, as, in this case, tau triple prime divided by tau prime minus um, 3 halves uh, tau double prime tau prime uh, squared. Yeah, right. Uh, you mean here? Yeah, right, you're, you're right. Let's do the same thing here. Yeah, I was hesitating whether I want to call this thing the two-form or the, the scalar. Uh, but OK, fine. Um, um, thank you. Are there other questions at this point? So this is just basic. Uh, so later, I'm going to tell you more about how to actually solve this theory and how to relate it uh, to this particular theory. Um, uh, so this theory, again, lives in, uh, in two dimensions. Uh, and this theory essentially lives on the boundary uh, of that theory. Uh, uh, so indeed, there are a couple more details to this particular theory that have to do with the fact that I want to indeed be able to put this theory um, in, in a, in a, in a two-dimensional space-time. Uh, indeed, because of the equations of motion, sorry, there should be a plus sign here as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, that R is actually negative if lambda, if, if lambda, okay, it depends on whether I call lambda positive or negative, but for an ADS space-time, if lambda is, uh, the, is minus lambda is the curvature of the ADS space-time, then indeed this will tell me uh, that, that um, uh, the, the corresponding geometry uh, is a constantly curved, negatively curved space. Uh, and um, I'll talk more about that uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, but just to give you at least a, a gist of how these two things are related, it turns out that if you indeed put the um, space-time, uh, this two-dimensional space-time, and, and you draw it on a, on, a, on a disk, because this is basically the Euclidean, uh, it's called the Poincaré disk. You saw the picture actually in the slides that uh, Jan had, uh, where you had the, the Escher drawing on this thing. If this is ADS2, um, basically the boundary, the volume blows up. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of this, this hyperbolic plane. 
Uh, but then it turns out that what you actually need to do is you need to uh, allow for the boundary to be slightly off the infinite boundary, and you have to allow for this, basically, the space-time to fluctuate, uh, to for its boundary to fluctuate. Uh, and, uh, uh, and since there are no degrees of freedom in the interior, uh, all the degrees of freedom are sitting basically in this fluctuating boundary, and it turns out that that degree of freedom is captured by this thing here. Uh, and this is called Schwarzschild quantum mechanics. And now it turns out that, that, that this whole picture here that, that's uh, um, uh, uh, summarizing basically how holography in low dimensions works, uh, if you understand it in three dimensions, you can immediately actually d deduce the two-dimensional picture from it just by doing dimensional reduction. So these, the, the 3D and the 2D versions of this particular diagram again, are pretty intimately related to each other. And it's maybe not entirely surprising because we've already seen this swatch and derivative also showing up in the CFT2 story. So uh, this is CFT D. So when D is 2, uh, this is two-dimensional CFT. Uh, when D is 1, this should be a one-dimensional CFT. Uh, and let me already mention what the, uh, what, what the best model is that we have for the one-dimensional CFT. So it's either uh, a 2D in 2D, it will be a t a two dimensions. Uh, it will be, um, again, a CFT. Uh, in 1D, uh, it's called the SYK model. Uh, and the SYK model is a, is a given model whose Hamiltonian I will actually be able to, uh, to describe for you. Uh, and then, indeed, uh, once one is able to identify this 1D theory um, uh, in, in the low energy region uh, with this particular uh, Swatch and quantum mechanics. So solving this theory um, uh, will actually involve also solving this theory. So that's sort of the landscape uh, of, of soluble, low-dimensional um, holo holographic models. Are there questions about this? Yes, a bunch of. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's. Yeah, so, so uh, let's say this way. Uh, if, if, if I want to go from uh, a microscopic description uh, of, of a system, it could be a gas or a fluid um, or something else, uh, then maybe there are different ways of doing the coarse grading. Uh, I, could, uh, I could sort of average over all possible fluids that I can write down and then uh, keep, keep the average theory as being my, my coarse grain theory. Or I can integrate. I can average over a certain amount of time, uh, or, or uh, there are all kinds of averaging procedures that one could do. Um, I would say uh, one of the surprises, a little bit of this particular um, uh, duality, I would uh, is, th is that that uh, this theory actually still, although it's sort of the effective description of that, it turns out this is still a quantum theory. It's not that I've taken h bar to zero literally. Uh, C is large, but I keep C finite, and it turns out that there's a lot of structure even uh, at finite C. Uh, so I would say the self-consistency equations that this thing has to satisfy, and the descent from self-consistency equations that this thing has to satisfy. But then you do exactly what you would normally do if you, if you think about um, uh, describing uh, uh, a gas or things like that. You only specify the macroscopic quantities that you know, uh, and then you indeed you average over the things that you don't know. So, so I, I don't have too many philo philosophical statements to make about what kind of thing I'm doing here. And actually, uh, I sort of a, a second what Jan was saying, namely that there is no f maybe no fundamental truth to how I'm going from here to there. Uh, at, at the point that I'm here, I, I, I no longer ca care necessarily. I've, I've given up on, on actually capturing the full fundamental theory. Uh, because I, I, I'm no longer uh, have the ambition of being able to resolve all the all the microstructure that sits here. And um, uh, and so again, this is an important part of the philosophy: is that again, in, as a high energy physicist, or y you hope that we will be able to find exactly which theory describes our world. 
but by now we kind of are becoming to become becoming more modest, where we say, hey, do you know what? We want to understand sort of the, grow, the the large scale fi features of our world already at the quantum level, and just we want to make sure that there some might be something that exists of this type, but we're not going to literally specify it. Um, yeah, the, 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 the question is about the heuristics. I would say the, the heuristics here is, is, is sort of in this picture, and I'll give another example actually in the 3D case, uh, in the 2D, 3D, in the 3D gravity case. So, so I'll, 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 I'll get to that question in, this, in the course of this lecture. Um, as I mentioned, at least, so the question is why is three, why, why if we really go to three plus one dimensions, where, where do we run into trouble? Uh, in three plus one dimensions, we have propagating gravitons, um, and then those propagating gravitons can uh, occur in scattering, um, and then you have loop diagrams that you have to take into account. So UV divergences um, uh, are sort of more serious in, in, in three plus uh, one dimensions. So, um, uh, but it, it, uh, there is sort of still the hope, I would say, that if we would actually really un fully understand this version of quantum gravity and kind of how it relates to something that might be more UV complete, that we will, will be able to lift all of some of those insights to three plus one dimensions. Right. Yeah. Uh, maybe this was a follow up on his question. So uh, I wonder if you could uh, say more about the nature of the soft mode you were talking about. Are we talking about some Goldstone mode or something like that? Yeah, I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll try to become more specific uh, uh, as, as I go. Uh, and it, tomorrow I'll introduce uh, the SYK model, um, and then I will be able to t tell you a bit more of how this thing comes about. Uh, today I will say a little bit uh, about how it comes about here, uh, although I'll be honest, um, uh, I'll probably will be sort of using uh, this, this equality as a motivation to capture what's happening here. And then I'll say a little bit more about how it relates to that. Uh, can you say uh, again, what is the universal relation between string theory uh, and pure quantum gravity? I mentioned before. Yeah, so, so what I mean by universal is that um, Again, it's, it's a common uh, property of string theories that, that, that if you have the closed string, uh, that the massless mode in the closed string is a graviton. So, so all string theories, at least in, uh, in a pretty large class of them, uh, have gravity as a low energy theory. Um, uh, and, um, and, and typically what might happen is that the low energy spectrum of the theory will have gravity. Uh, and, uh, and then this is often why I draw these few lines here. So I always have this sort of this universal part of the spectrum. Uh, and if you recall, by the way, uh, when I was doing this thing with the modular transformation of, the vac uh, of this vacuum character, in the end, I was only integrating over this part of the spectrum. So this part of the spectrum is where basically where the gravity sits. Um, and this part of the spectrum is, 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 is most universal. Uh, the light degrees of the, the light uh, fields in string theory often still depend on the string theory. So there are non-universal parts in the low energy theory of the string theory that may contain particles that are specific to a given string theory. But if I'm interested in the universal aspects of all these theories, for example, if I write on a black hole solution and I don't care too much about which matter fields are there present as well, then the, the properties of black holes are common to all the theories that have the same gravity theory. Uh, and then in that case, there, is, there actually, is actually a quantum theory over here that captures uh, a lot of the properties of those black holes. Uh, and, but this gravity theory you should not take completely seriously because this thing is only an approximation to that. And this is also an approximation to that. The slight surprise is that, that it's not just uh, in, the, in the classical limit that you can do gravity, you can still do quantum gravity on in, in, this lower, in this lower corner. By the way, uh, five years ago, or maybe six years ago, five years ago, I was invited uh, to give a talk, um, don't tell anyone, at the loop quantum gravity. 
uh, conference. Uh, 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 and, uh, um, uh, and actually, I, I gave them all of a branch. I indeed presented this particular uh, diagram. I said, okay, yeah, we, we guys, at least we string theorists, are sitting here. Um, uh, and, and, and we sort of take this one seriously. Uh, you guys are sitting here. Um, uh, and uh, and I I'm going to tell you, and this was six, six, seven years ago, uh, there will be a time where string theorists will start to think about this, and, and currently they are, uh, uh, indeed about sort of how to do pure quantum gravity. Uh, so we're all sort of essentially part, being part of the same program of trying to understand what's happening. But string theorists realize that this is not the complete answer. The complete answer sits here. Uh, and, and, and indeed, you, there's a lot to learn from thinking about quantum geometry of how it works. Uh, but uh, it, there's also a lot to learn from the inside that this is actually an approximation of a much, a much more complete and fine-grained uh, UV theory. Okay. Um. Uh, for the uh, let's say this way, because I don't think that, although there are many, uh, there are actually ways of deriving um, sort of black hole entropy from this. Um, uh, however, um, with with uh, some fine-grained um, uh, again uh, assumption, namely that that uh, I can write down a continuum spectrum. Uh, uh, which th this thing then gives rise to. Uh, and that continuum spectrum, although it was hard to draw it with the, with the, uh, the chalk like this, can still have a spectral density that d d depends continuously on the energy. But within each energy band, there's an infinite num number of states. Um, uh, and um, I, have one I told you about principles. I have one principle in my, in my uh, being a physicist. I don't believe in things that are infinite. I don't believe that, there, that in, if in nature there are numbers that are literally infinite. Uh, so there should be a finite number of states here. Um, uh, uh, and, and if there's a finite number of states, it sort of starts, should start looking like that. Um, one small caveat, I should say, whenever I draw these pictures, is that here I'm assuming that I literally have energy eigenstates so that every I energy state is 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 um, uh, is stable, um, uh, and that's still an assumption. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, real quantum systems have a discrete spectrum. Um, uh, quantum systems that have a continuum spectrum, I'm sort of I'm more suspicious of, uh, and that's somewhat related to again ha uh, wanting to have finite answers when I compute things like entanglement entropy or entropy. Uh, I want entropy to be finite, and then there should be a more a better UV description. Okay, so uh, maybe in the, uh, uh, for the interest of time and also sort of to, to, to go to a more specific description, and indeed there was this question of how do I understand how um, uh, to go from uh, this side to that side, where is the soft mode? Let me give you an example indeed in two plus one dimensions. Um, so, um, okay, now I need to briefly uh, get a formula, which I don't want to make a mistake in. And I only have it on my laptop. <laughs> I'm going to write down um, the black hole solution uh, in ADS space time. Um, and um, I wrote down one version of it earlier. Um, and then, give me a second, I have to find the name of the file. Uh, I'm going to write down the, uh, the BTC black hole solution, but in a particular coordinate system. Uh, let's do it this way. Here it comes. Okay, the S squared. I already wrote down the, uh, the BTC black hole, uh, but as I said, there are all kinds of coordinate systems that one can choose. Uh, 
And there might be even be slightly different ways of writing down essentially the same thing. Um, uh, t times T, so T U U T V V. Uh, D U D V uh, plus T U U D U squared plus T V V D V squared. Okay. Now, um, maybe already suggestively, um, what this uh, describes uh, is an ADS space time. Um, indeed, if t the t's are equal to zero, this is actually manifestly ADS. dr squared plus e to the 2r times du dv. That's an ADS space time. Uh, so, what I've done basically here is I've taken the um, the CFT and I've turned on a stress energy tensor. <laughs> this is the expectation value of the CFT stress energy tensor. Uh, for the left movers, this is for the right movers. Uh, and then I have computed basically the back reaction on the geometry. <laughs> or inversely, I could have taken this geometry and I could have asked what's the stress on the boundary. Uh, and the stress on the boundary is given by these quantities. And um, now, it turns out actually that this geometry, uh, to some extent, is actually just a, a, a version of, of anti de Sitter space time, but I've just chosen another coordinate system. Uh, and indeed, it's possible to just uh, introduce a, a, a function that I call uh, big U, uh, and, it's pos uh, and I can write uh, these two things uh, like so. Uh, so uh, the T's are actually just Schwarzschild derivatives, turns out. Uh, and, uh, and again, this is uh, known as the Bonyadoz metric. And essentially, you way the way you have to think about it is you start with the, if, uh, suppose that T would be a constant. Uh, this is just a constant number. You plug it into here. Then actually, you're going to find um, that this is equivalent to the BTC black hole. Um, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, uh, where's my uh, thing? Uh, there's a relation between uh, the mass uh, and the spin of the black hole. So uh, if I have a, a mass for the black hole, it can also have angular momentum. Um, uh, it turns out that the following rela relation is true, that if I just integrate uh, TUU, if this is on a on a ADS space time with a cylindrical boundary, I integrate this over the cylindrical boundary. Boundary, I get m plus j, uh, and I can um, do that integral. Uh, depends on whether this is uh, non-zero or not. No, the thing is that if this if this integral is non-zero, um, then then I can, uh, then, then then this is this is the BTC black hole. Thank you. OK, good. OK, good. <laughs> I've asked Jan to be here to ask questions. So what Jan said. <laughs> good. Uh, uh, so, so, so indeed, if t is constant, I can actually uh, not write it like that by means of a, const uh, by, by means of a, a, a single value transformation. Uh, so, 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 so if, because I was implicitly putting this thing on a cylinder, uh, if u and v were single value transformations of coordinates on the uh, on the cylinder, then this integral actually had to be equal to zero. Uh, you can show that. Um, um, uh, 
Uh, yeah, but the, uh, the thing is that, that okay, let me just make the technical comment uh, without necessarily deriving it, is that if I, uh, so, so um, there, there is a, 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 a cylinder, um, yeah, by the way, so this is going to be the entertainment from now on because <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to convince uh, Jan of something that he wasn't convinced of like yesterday, and, uh, and we'll see if this works out or not. <laughs> 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 Maybe he prevents me from even <laughs> getting to the point. Uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, indeed, if you go around the cylinder, uh, it's not necessary for the U and the V coordinate to come back to themselves. Uh, actually, it's not maybe that surprising that the UV coordinate can come back to itself up to one of these transformations that I wrote down earlier. So, uh, uh, so if I have a um, uh, uh, an SL to Z transformation, SL to R transformation, uh, and I have a multivariate coordinate here. Uh, I claim that basically the quantity that I'm computing here uh, is related uh, to what's called the conjugacy class of this particular uh, SL to R matrix. Uh, and, and it's precisely these kind of boundary conditions that if you have a, a non trivial boundary condition, so the ba way you get the BTZ black hole is to actually start with empty ADS. And then you take an orbi fold, basically, or you fold it up precisely by uh, allowing uh, the, ma uh, the coordinates to be multivalued when you go around. Uh, and it's the BTC black hole is parameterized by those, param uh, by those parameters. Yes? Um, so in this case, I would say that uh, you, uh, 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 at this point, I would probably want to have this to be equal to uh, theta plus, I keep forgetting if I write on top of I theta, it's theta plus I tau, uh, plus I tau, or let me call it T or tau, uh, let's call it T. Uh, the little v's is theta plus I T, okay. So, so by going around... Oh, sorry, minus sign here, yeah. Oh, sorry, if I do this in, by the way, if I do this in Lorentzian space-time, then the I is no longer there. So then I would just do this. If I want to go to Euclidean, then I call it Z and Z, Z bar, and I put the I in it. So going around the cylinder, you mean, like, if U is only capital so, U? Yeah, so if, if theta goes for theta plus 2 pi. Mm -hmm. Then both U and Vs are changing, right? Then U both U and V are changing. Here I wrote it down for v U, but there's a similar oh, okay. equation for V. Okay. Uh, and since and indeed, indeed, if the angular momentum is non-zero, then V is doing something different than you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, because there might be a coordinate transformation in this. Okay. These equations are correct, <laughs> uh, and that's actually sort of important. Um, so, so people were asking, okay, uh, wh where do I find the soft mode? Uh, I claim that this, this U uh, and the V uh, should be thought of as the soft mode. Um, uh, and as I was mentioning before, from the point of view of the CFT, the way you would have to think about the U and the V uh, is as um, uh, if, if big U is equal to little U, uh, then this describes few ADS, and then I'm in the space uh, uh, in the coordinate in which the CFT is in the vacuum state. But then indeed, you can, as, as Jan was saying, even if you have a single value transformation, you can still have non-zero uh, stress energy. Um, but um, there are funny properties of this swatch uh, that actually imply that <laughs> there's some positive and negative energy involved. <laughs> so. Um, uh, but anyway, so, so this is sort of interesting. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we could ask um, uh, is, so I was talking about the Schwarz and quantum mechanics. So I have this integral here that describes um, this, uh, the quantum mechanics that describes um, this dual theory in the 1D case. Uh, in the 2D case, I have these two quantities that kind of, if I plug this into here, 
this integral here looks like that of Schwarzschild quantum mechanics. Um, so what I'm going to do actually right currently is I'm going to um, ask the following question, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, so we've been talking about uh, black hole entropy, uh, and, and I claim that there's some way of understanding the entropy here in terms of the soft mode. Um, now, um, let's still take the following uh, uh, dictionary. As I was mentioning, if C goes large, it's a little bit like taking h bar to zero. Uh, and, uh, uh, and indeed, if you, if you look carefully enough, uh, if I write down the Vera Zero algebra, and I put a one over h bar in front of, this, uh, of the Vera Zero generators, uh, and I identify h bar uh, with one over c, uh, then indeed uh, the Vera Zero algebra will have uh, a central um, uh, extension. Uh, let's say it a bit. What you're going to see is that the c to infinity limit is precisely the limit where h bar goes to zero. So suppose that I'm going to think about uh, h bar to zero uh, in the gravity theory. Uh, and uh, suppose that I want to compute something that would be equivalent of uh, entropy. And the way I'm going to do that is as follows. It's go I'm, I'm going to specify uh, an energy window, which I've been doing uh, in, the, in, in the previous descriptions as well, uh, where uh, m plus j and m minus j are fixed uh, within a certain energy window, delta m, uh, and angular momentum window delta j. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to fix these two things um, in such a way that, that, that um, I am going to look at all the solutions such that these integrals are, are sitting uh, uh, in a certain win energy window uh, specified by delta m and delta j. Okay? Which means that I, I, I now am going to look at, at a collection of uh, coordinate transformations u such that these integrals um, give me uh, this number up to a certain accuracy. There's a question. Could you repeat why h going to zero is c going to infinity, or like that relation between h and center? Yeah, let, let, me, let me see in the, if I can get this thing right. So. Um, So there's a certain commutation relation that I can write down for the u coordinates, which I'm not going to write down, such that um, it will give me the commutation relations for the Vera Zero algebra for t and t bar. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, uh, let's say that there is some commutation relation but, uh, that I can write down for the u coordinates, which is of order h bar, uh, from which I can derive uh, that this expression t um, uh, will. Okay, sorry. This thing here is, is basically L0. <laughs> Uh, and I can also write down corresponding expressions where I put e to the i and theta here, mm -hmm. uh, or e to the i and u, if you wish. Um, uh, uh, so I can write down the analog of uh, ln uh, expressions that are uh, essentially, uh, and allow me to write down this expression. Okay. And then, in the end, I claim that there are commutation relations uh, for this particular soft mode that I can write down uh, that will give rise to the Vera Zoro algebra. Uh, but actually, um, 
because it's a commutation relation, I would want to put an h bar here. Uh, and I can put an h bar here by putting an h bar here by absorbing a factor of h bar in L. So let me do the following. Uh, let me define funny else that satisfy this first equation where funny L uh, is h bar times um, big L. Uh, forget about this term for a second. Uh, you can see that if a straight L had the thing without the h bar, then the funny L has the thing with the h bar. Because there's an h bar here, there's an h bar here, there's an h bar squared there, one of them gets absorbed. But now since I multiply this by h bar squared, there's an h bar squared now sitting here. Uh, and uh, if I make this to be um, a constant, oh, oh sorry, this, this is, if this is going to be of order h bar, uh, if c is of order h uh, is of order one over h bar, so this whole right hand side is now of order h bar by putting c equals to one over h bar. So then, then if I replace this thing by h bar, then indeed I have something that looks like a, a, a commutator, and now sending h bar to zero because of this relation corresponds to sending uh, c to infinity. Thanks. Yeah, okay, so, uh, this is getting uh, distracting. Um, so, so, of course, what I'm doing here, uh, if you wish, um, here I was in, in Laurentian uh, uh, coordinates. Uh, if I want to go to uh, uh, Euclidean coordinates, then I am, am in Z, Z bar uh, coordinates. Um, uh, and and uh, the contour integral that I'm doing there is actually in the, in the complexified a uh, coordinate system where I'm uh, contour integrating around the origin in the complex coordinate system. And since t is such a function of z, I can think about this basically as a, uh, yeah. Okay, so thanks. But um, um, the key point that I'm making here is that, that, that um, uh, one can ask initially uh, about the, um, uh, this particular question. And the reason I'm, I'm sending h bar to zero here is because I want to do the following. Is, um, uh, so let me erase this if that's okay with you because I want to continue my story here. I want to ask uh, what is the volume Uh, of the space of all uh, solutions uh, of this type that fit in this uh, in this energy window. What I uh, claim is that uh, what I'm actually interested in is uh, is is the phase space volume. Uh, and it's true that if I write down a classical solution uh, of, a, of, a, of a theory, of any theory that you have, the space of classical solutions is equivalent to phase space. Because what is phase space? Phase space is the thing that I need to, I need to give you a point on phase space, and that point on phase space will then determine with the Hamiltonian evolution a, a classical trajectory. So the space of all classical trajectories uh, is, the, is equivalent to phase space, now, if this here is phase space, and I'm asking you to, to compute the volume of phase space, in classical statistical mechanics, that's actually another definition of the entropy. Secretly, uh, in classical mechanics, and by the way, this comes a little bit to this theme here, <laughs> uh, is that uh, before people did actually quantum statistical mechanics, they were doing classical statistical mechanics, I assume. Uh, and then they were integrating over phase space, uh, and, and they imagined counting something, uh, namely the number of microstates. 
Now, if the number of microstates was actually supposed to be a finite no number, then in their mind they were doing this. Um, but integrating over phase space means integrating over dp dq. But the way we integrate over dp dq is actually uh, uh, nowadays, if I see dp dq, I always put a 2 pi h bar below it. Because h bar indeed has dimension of, moment, uh, of, 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 of action. Uh, and this is how I integrate over phase space. So if I give you a phase space and it has a finite volume in h bar units, what does the volume of phase space tell me uh, in h bar units? The number of quanta, yeah, basically if I do a WKB uh, computation, uh, then basically I can localize my wave function within delta P delta Q equals H bar. So the number of wave functions that I can fit on this phase space is proportional to the volume, um, uh, which means that the dimension of the Hilbert space is actually e to the power uh, that volume. Uh, uh, which means that uh, this is, is a proxy for the, um, uh, for the entropy, okay? So, uh, so if I want to compute this particular quantity, uh, and let me do it just for the uh, quantity um, uh, for this piece, uh, and, uh, because otherwise I have to write down too many integrals. I'm going to write down the volume of phase space for which that thing is true, uh, and I claim that what I need to do is I need to integrate over all the functions u. Uh, restrict it to the condition that this thing fits within uh, a certain energy window. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to be doing, uh, let me do the following. Let me introduce uh, a thing that I call beta, uh, uh, which is just a number. Uh, and suppose that I would know how to compute this thing. Then from knowing this particular function, which I can call z of beta, I should be able to compute the volume of the thing that sits within uh, uh, this uh, window. Uh, let me call that volume. Uh, let me give it a name. Uh, so the, the volume of the space of solutions, I'll write it down here for you. The volume would be, as I mentioned, it's e to the power of the entropy that I want to associate with that number times delta of m plus j. So if I get a number for the volume, I can extract an entropy from it. And I do that this particular. Uh, uh, I, yeah, so, OK, are we good? Uh, it's multivalued use, but with a very precise multivaluedness. Namely, uh, use can be multivalued in this way in such a way that this, is, this equation here is true. So this specified the multivaluedness. Right. Uh, the two are related. I think if, if this thing has a certain answer, uh, it's indeed in terms of that boundary condition. Le uh, le uh, yeah, so, so it's a good question. Um, um, so the way in which, by the way, so this, this, by this thing here, if after I insert uh, this definition that T is, is, is this, uh, this fortune, let me already do that here. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So there's a symplectic. So here I'm doing a path integral. It's not a. It's not an ordinary integral. It's a path integral. 
Uh, and as Jan was saying, is that there is a particular measure that you have to put here, which is called the symplectic volume. Um, and, and actually, previously, I did kind of explain to you what symplectic volume I'm using here. Uh, namely, um, uh, I'm going to um, put in the fact that this T has to satisfy the various row algebra. That implies a commutation relation for the use. And that's the corresponding symplectic form that I'm writing down here. Uh, and this thing here, by the way, is Schwarzschild quantum mechanics. So by asking this particular question, what is the volume of, my, uh, of the space of solutions uh, of this particular, uh, uh, I'm actually uh, uh, asked to compute this particular integral. Yeah, so, so, so um, uh, indeed, so what I'm going to do, indeed, I am going to take C to infinity, but I'm doing it in a special way. Uh, I want to compute the volume, but restrict it to this particular window. So this is, this, uh, if you wish, this is a micro-canonical specification. Of the, of the integral that I want to compute, where I say I, I want a sum over the volume that's microcanonically specified to be in this particular window. Uh, and instead of computing the microcanonical one, I'm first going to con compute the canonical partition function. And indeed, I will have to do a Legendre transform in order to go from this quantity to that quantity. Okay? So my goal is to compute the microcanonical entropy by first computing uh, the the macro uh, yeah the canonical ensemble partition function canonical partition function okay. So I'm going to do that, uh, this, this computation for you, uh, depending on time. Um, I started at 1.30, uh, 2.30, half an hour. Uh, I don't want to sort of uh, rush too much, but uh, are, there are there questions besides Jan? <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll, I'll reactivate you later, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> The <laughs> exponential is somehow supposed to implement this constraint of being in that m delta m plus j window, right? Yeah. In so, in so, so, so indeed, uh, I'm in. Uh, sorry. No. At this point, so uh, uh, yeah, good questions. Uh, okay, fine. Let me try to be more clear. Uh, um, my goal is to compute this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I haven't I haven't computed it for you yet. Uh, my intermediate quantity that I want to compute is this one. And then I'm going to tell you afterwards how to go from this quantity to that quantity. Okay? Uh, and, and the intuition is if I know this thing for every beta, mm -hmm. then just by doing the appropriate manipulation with this particular thing, I can compute for you what, uh, what the answer is to this particular question. This is, this is what you would call the micro-canonical mm -hmm. partition yeah, function. Yeah. And this is the macro-canonical partition function. And that's a standard way of going between the two. Yeah, my only question was somehow the exponential factor that you put in should help you, right, in computing going from Z of beta. In some right. limit of beta, you should Yeah, since, that. Since, since I want to be able to put a restriction on this yeah, particular yeah, integral, exactly. yeah. I'm just putting it there so that it later on I will be capable of putting that okay. restriction in it. Okay. Into okay. it. Correct. Correct. Is it clear what the thin space volume is for the microcanonic group? If we said we use the Theodore algebra, that gives you a particular thin space volume, but that uh, is in a particular Theodore order. But if you include many to the Theodore order, and the volume may be directional, it's not an obvious Theodore order, it's not. 
Right, I'm using exactly the, the correct uh, symplectic form that's defined on the space of all orbits. Um, uh, that's the one I'm using here. Uh, that's done indeed by this integral. So in Swatch and Quantum, in, yeah. Uh, it's the. Um, Right. Uh, it's actually it's it's the thing that's uh, that's called the model space, or it, it's it's it follows from the the Virasoro group. There's a natural measure on the on the Virasoro group, which indeed involves this these multivariate uh, boundary. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so, so at least from the point, of, so let, yeah, just <laughs> to get the people here still in, in, into the picture. Uh, so, so from the point of view of gravity, what I'm doing here, uh, so, so let, do you know, let, let me take, put on my, my gravity hat uh, for a moment. Um, then indeed, um, what I should do uh, is to take the gravity theory, uh, write down this particular uh, uh, parameterization of the classical solutions of the gravity theory. The gravity theory itself comes with a certain symplectic form, uh, a Poisson bracket that I would be able to derive from the gravity theory. That's the Poisson bracket that I should use in order to integrate, uh, to, to define uh, what's called an, uh, an integration measure on, this, on, the, uh, on the phase space, which is basically this thing. Um, uh, and that phase space measure is the one that I'm using to do that integral. Uh, and indeed, as you were, as you were saying, uh, in the end, I, I still have to take h bar to zero, which is c to infinity, uh, and that turns out to be the correct uh, uh, measure that I have to use to do that integral. I'm going to do the computation for you. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to do this. In, uh, uh, this, this. Uh, yeah. So the measure is indeed determined just by the phase space, um, uh, and 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 uh, it's it's this notation of just calling it du is the correct notation. Uh, and, and, and indeed, we're going to get the Cardi formula. Uh, and, and if it's okay with you, since you're referring to the Cardi formula, let me get the Cardi formula out of this thing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's a bit related to what Jan was asking, but maybe it's just for me to clarify. So um, the space you're integrating over is determined by this sort of boundary condition you put or the, the sort of multivaluedness you uh, allow, right? Right. By the way, let me, let, let me, uh, I want to briefly make a comment for the experts, okay? Uh, for the experts that have studied um, Swatch and quantum mechanics, so this thing is called, again, Swatch and quantum mechanics, where you take a, uh, it's quantum mechanics because here it was T, there is U, U and T are kind of just uh, the same thing, so I'm just having a one-dimensional system. My dynamical degree of freedom is the, here the tau, there it's called big U, same thing. Um, uh, the, the, the one subtlety of Swatch and quantum mechanics is that this tau variable doesn't need to be periodic uh, 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 if I take the thermal partition function of this Swatch and quantum mechanics. Uh, and, and it's precisely the way Swatch and quantum mechanics is being put at finite temperature is precisely by allowing this. Uh, so, so all the complaints that are sort of being sort of thrown into this discussion uh, is a complaint that one can apply to Schwarzschild quantum mechanics as well. So in Schwarzschild quantum mechanics, the, this, this u variable is indeed multivalued, and in Schwarzschild quantum mechanics, the measure that one is using is the one that Jan indeed identifies as that knows about the multivaluedness of okay. the, um, and it's the appropriate measure that one should use if you use the phase space volume uh, method for gravity. So this is definitely the, the, the right representation of this uh, of getting to this answer. Yeah, I wasn't complaining about that. I was just trying to see uh, 
is is the phase space in this case like like a coadjoint orbit of the diffeomorphism group or good like, uh, thank you uh, so I wasn't introducing that language but it's true that 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 this tau of t parameterizes something that's called uh, diff s1 uh, and why it's called diff s1 is because this t is a circle tau of t is a diffeomorphism on the circle um, it turns out that diff s1 is precisely also what we would call the Vera Zorro group. So the Vera Zorro transformation, uh, the, the, the conformal transformations, which were functions of transformations on a variable z, z is also diff s1. Uh, and indeed, um, yeah, so, so, so the, 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 the symplectic form is the one that you would naturally put on diff yeah, s1. Yeah, there's a natural symplectic structure, I guess. So uh, that's yeah. correct. Uh, and the symplectic form uh, 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 structure is actually labeled by C. It knows about the central charge, and central charge is, uh, um, uh, or let's say this way, <laughs> if I go from the symplectic structure, it's not labeled by C. If I want to go from the symplectic structure to commutators, I have to introduce an H bar, and that H bar becomes C. Um, uh, so, need, uh, so that's an important comment, is that this thing is actually a phase space. There's natural commutation relations on that phase space, and those commutation relations on the phase space are the Vera Zora algebra. But then it's all sort of the integral is well-defined, then it's... Yeah, canceled. right. So the at that yeah. point, the integral yeah. is indeed well-defined. So indeed, there are different ways in which people have computed this thing. Uh, one way of computing it is indeed the way that uh, Witten and, and Stanford did, where they used some kind of localization argument to do that integral. Um, uh, I, my my um, interpretation of this is, is slightly different. Uh, indeed, what I'm imagining doing, and this actually is sort of precisely uh, thinking about this thing here, is uh, suppose that I have a phase space Uh, and uh, suppose that I want to uh, compute e to the minus beta h of p and q. But uh, I want to compute this particular quantity. So I have, a, so this is briefly sort of uh, slightly more general. If I want to compute this, this particular integral, but I take h bar to zero, then indeed I'm doing classical uh, statistical mechanics. I'm basically integrating over the phase space dp dq over 2 pi h bar, say, uh, e to the minus beta h p q. And um, so indeed, uh, one can um, um, com compute this quantity uh, on the right-hand side, um, uh, but then interpret it in this particular way. Um, uh, and if there's an h bar to zero, yeah, if I take the h bar to zero limit, uh, rather than taking the trace, I'm actually integrating it over the volume of phase space. Maybe uh, instead of sort of trying to sort of rush the argument right now, um, I'm going to give you the answer uh, to the set of beta, and then probably I'll um, uh, explain where that answer is coming from in a moment. Um, the answer for z of beta uh, turns out to be this. Uh, times the pre-coefficient that I'm going to ignore. Uh, we'll explain later. Uh, but for those of you who paid attention, uh, and again, I apologize that before the, uh, in the morning I actually was me 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 messing up my factors of pi a little bit. So I, I, at some point I was ignoring factors of pi. But if I put the factors of pi back again, then this is actually the answer that I had on my blackboard earlier on for a CFT partition function in the uh, beta to zero limit. So a CFT partition function uh, with with a certain uh, sorry, there should be a, a coefficient in front of this thing. Uh, sorry. Um. Uh, 
Yeah, I put uh, I put uh, units actually where 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 I wrote down the Schwarzschild quantum mechanics where I put c equals one, which I can do uh, because it turns out that the big c that I had before the Schwarzschild quantum mechanics action can be put equal to one. And in that case, this is the correct answer. Normally, there would still be a length scale in the problem, but I put that equal to one, and I can absorb that in my definition of beta. So this is turns out to be the answer. Uh, and let me uh, then need, suppose that this is the answer, and then I, I'll explain to you then how to go from this answer uh, to uh, an answer for that. Um, because what I should do is I, could, I should interpret this, uh, and since I'm, uh, I don't want to write down m plus j too many times, so let me call this variable e. Uh, and the, th the quantity that I want to compute uh, is the entropy. So the way I'm integrating over E, uh, I want to compute this particular quantity, E to the S of E. Um, uh, and the way I'm doing that is by um, indeed taking the partition sum, which means I'm, I'm summing over all possible states. I take into account the level density of the states and I write down e to the minus beta h, which is putting minus beta, beta e here, okay? So I want to find the s of e such that this is, e uh, is equal to that. Uh, I wanted to make this actually uh, initially homework, but why not just briefly go through it because it's, I think it's actually quite inst instructive. It's very basic, it's just the way you do thermodynamics, but to me actually I always learn <laughs> for myself why. Uh, when I do this. So the way you do that is by essentially um, uh, what you um, do is you, you look at the, uh, the saddle point equation of this, uh, this integral, um, uh, and the saddle point of equation of that integral is where this, the action is stationary, this integral is stationary, and that gives me the equation beta is the S the E. Yeah, the S the E. Which, of course, is another uh, way of thinking about the first law of thermodynamics, the fact that uh, the S uh, is, uh, okay, uh, is T dE. It's the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, uh, sorry, the opposite one of it is T dS. Thank you. Because uh, beta, that would have been beta. So that's the first law. Uh, and that's the saddle point of this particular equation. Um, another thing that you can uh, use is that uh, if I differentiate uh, the log of the of beta respect to beta, uh, I get uh, I bring down e, and I get the expectation value of e, and this is what I call e. So that's the expectation method minus sign. Uh, so if I do that here. Uh, give me a, uh, uh, then I get uh, that pi squared over beta squared uh, is equal to e. Uh, I'm briefly uh, confused about a sign, but let me uh, just continue for this moment. Uh, this equation tells me that beta um, beta squared is um, pi over square root of e. Uh, uh, and uh, from that, I get that S of E uh, is 2 pi times square root of E. Uh, so indeed, what I'm finding uh, is that the entropy uh, of this particular uh, system, so the thing that I've been computing, uh, is the 2 pi uh, of the square root of that quantity E. Uh, and need, if I now start putting in uh, the various values uh, of the um, uh, the values of the central charge and all that into this ex expression, uh, this is actually the Cardi formula. Uh, in the Cardi formula, if you wish, uh, we also had this uh, square root of the energy in there, uh, and it's precisely true uh, that the Cardi formula indeed is 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 a way of measuring uh, the volume of phase space of the solution. Now, 
uh, why is this actually an unusual um, uh, result? Um, um, uh, before I get to that, if you want to ask the question. Uh, okay. Yeah, good. So I didn't follow the logic there. Means here, what we were supposed to do is somehow show that that integral would give us something like de exponential se. Yeah, so I, 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 will, I will explain where this is coming from. Yes, OK, yeah. go ahead. No, no, not, not means I, I, I'm not talking about the calculation yeah. of the integral. But somehow here, what we did is we imposed that this is equal to this and then derived the Cardi formula. But I thought the logic that I was missing there was why does that integral equal to the volume? Um, you mean why this integral equals to that volume? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's this particular calculation that I'm doing here. Because the thing that's actually the volume is this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and that's this equation. Yeah. Uh, so, so the volume of phase space is e to the power of the entropy times dE. Yeah, that so I'm interested in computing this quantity. Yes. But I first compute this quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way you go from this quantity to that quantity is by indeed finding the S of E so that this is equal to that. And how do I do that? I require, first of all, that I go to the settle point. I do the first law of thermodynamics. That's evaluating the right-hand side through the settle point approximation. And then I require that beta is chosen such that this quantity is true, that this equation is true. I see. Because I want to relate beta to the energy. Energy, okay. I see, okay. Uh, and then, so, so now if I can use this equation then to eliminate beta in terms of E. I go back up here and I get S in, in, in terms of E. So then it turns out that if I take this S and I put it in here and I do this integral, I get that quantity. Okay. Got it. Okay. So so um so the, the, the claim is, again, that uh, in Schwarzschild quantum mechanics, you can actually do this computation. But the, the reason why you can do the computation is precisely because of the relationship actually turns out with, with this Vera Zorro, uh, with this dip S1 structure. Uh, but uh, the reason why, why Jan actually objected to this particular statement uh, is the following, is that uh, this is the Cardi formula. Uh, and um, typically, at least when people explain what uh, the relationship is between um, the CFT uh, and, and, and at finite temperature uh, and, and, the, and the gravity in the bulk uh, is where we, we would do the following. We would say, um, okay, the CFT is at finite temperature uh, um, and it means that there is indeed entropy associated with it and Cardi has t told us how to compute that. Now we go to the bulk, uh, and then in the bulk we actually have a black hole, and then we don't know anything about the entropy initially because we don't know which degrees of freedom are describing the black hole. The only thing that we have is the bekenstein hawking calculation, uh, and the bekenstein hawking calculation is one where we just take the black hole and we compute the area of the horizon divided by four. Okay. Now, uh, I assume that this is a calculation that uh, was in Jan's lecture, uh, and that you indeed, when you have the BTC black hole, you can actually predict what the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is, and, and that's also the Cardi entropy. So, this is both, uh, uh, it's also the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. I should say that I've, I've done one little trick that I should have mentioned to you uh, here. I've taken C to infinity which means that I've taken the ADS space-time to be um, very large. The curvature uh, and it goes, becomes very big. Uh, I've effectively sent the Newton constant to zero, um, which means that the Planck length uh, in the bulk has gone to zero. Nonetheless, I want to keep the entropy of the, of the black hole finite. 
So, and this is actually an, uh, an, uh, an additional explanation to, to Jan also, namely that, that uh, so, so this statement that the, the entropy, the, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy and this volume are related, is only sort of uh, under control in this h bar to zero limit. And the type of black holes that we're looking at here are the ones that basically are very small in ADS. I'm taking the G Newton to zero, but the entropy of the black hole remains finite. Uh, so in, 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 in shrinking Planck units, the entropy is still a finite number. Um, but then even that is still a surprising statement because typically what people are doing when they're talking about the entropy of a black hole is that this is the information that's hidden inside of the black hole. Uh, and we're thinking about the black hole as a black hole, uh, as, a, as a black hole should be. We want to think about a black hole as a black hole. Now what is a black hole? You st throw stuff in it and it goes away. This here, the T's, are things that are parameterizing the soft modes that sit at infinity. This is stuff we can see. Um, so if you think that stuff that's in hidden inside of the black hole is actually hidden inside of the black hole, I'm telling you that, that I, can, I can account for the stuff that sits inside of the black hole by just counting the entropy of, the, of something that sits outside of it. Um, many people, most of my colleagues would not believe this, um, that this is a general story. Maybe this is special to um, uh, uh, 2D CFT. Or they might say, hey, uh, I've, done, I've put some the answer in by hand. Uh, but in, uh, to me, this is a very a strong indication of sort of a philosophy that actually people like Andrew Stromager also have been emphasizing, is that when you do black hole physics, often we talk about the no-hair theorem, uh, where the no-hair theorem is something that tells us, okay, the black hole is a unique object. Uh, and indeed, it's true that up to single-valued coordinate transformation, I can make this T to be constant. And up to a single valued coordinate transformation, I can make these t's to just be numbers. Rather than specifying the contour integral to be m plus j, I can just put the, the t to be m plus j, and then it seems that this my, my black hole solution is unique. Uh, and then my volume would be extremely small. I just count for everything the, the length of the interval. But the fact is, is that, that, that even if this, uh, this is fixed, there's other information in the geometry uh, that allows this t to fluctuate over a, 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 a more degrees of freedom. Those degrees of freedom are associated with the following, is that locally, indeed, the black hole looks completely standard. That's the no-hair theorem. And it's just parameterized by the numbers m and j. Globally, the space-time has an asymptotic region. Asymptotically, I can also make the, the space-time look like ADS3. But there's a coordinate transformation between the local coordinate uh, region of the black hole and the asymptotic region of the ADS space-time. And that coordinate transformation is, is, is what this thing is doing. So this thing is parameterizing that coordinate transformation. This is something that we call a soft mode because it's captured by the whole space-time. Uh, and I've computed for you how much information there is, how much entropy there is in the soft mode. And the entropy that sits in the soft mode uh, is actually um, a good quantitative measure of the entropy that we would associate with the black hole. So this is food for thought. Um, uh, because most, a, a lot of people would sort of think about, again, entropy of black holes sitting inside of it, uh, whereas actually, for those of you who have thought about, heard about islands, maybe this thing should perhaps look a little bit less surprising uh, that there is actually probably entropy associated with what sits outside. I should stop here and still until there and ask for questions. Okay, questions?
if you take TUU and TVV to be constant, arbitrary constant, so that's constant M and J, then you have a sub-manifold of the full phase space. Right. What's the symplectic form on that sub-manifold? Roughly that J and M are uh, canonically going at something like this. And with no prefactor. There's not secretly a Bekenstein Hawking entropy prefactor sitting in this thing. No. There's no Bekenstein. No, right. Because Bekenstein Hawking goes with an exponential or something. Because you want to put an e to the s here. <laughs> uh, and it's yeah, 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 yeah. No, just uh, yeah. 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 So, so, so you claim it's just uh, the m wedge dj. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, yeah. If you if you want to turn the symplectic form into a commutator, or if you want to normalize it, then it would be have. A, I'm not sure. So this mixes left and right movers. This is like dl not wedge dl not bar. Yeah, this tells physically what this tells you is that if you put a mass here. Uh, I'm creating a conical deficit. So M rotates, uh, at least it's dual to, to rotations. Uh, so that's why this, this is the natural symplectic form uh, that sits on the, uh, if you just restrict to, that, to those things, yeah, that's right. right. If that's the right symplectic form and in the orthogonal directions, you just have fear of Zorro, basically, because for M, each M and J, there's just periodic. Uh, uh, you can take periodic U and V, right? So you can roughly uh, write everything in terms of. Uh, right. You can parameterize uh, everything in terms of a constant M, a constant J, and a periodic U and a periodic V. That that also parameterizes completely this set of solutions. Uh, yeah, but uh, so, so you don't. The, the restriction that to u equals constant is 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 a uh, yeah, and it's a special one. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I'm I'm saying if you if you allow yourself to start with a constant m and a constant j, and then act on it. Uh, yeah. Now let's say this way: the part where you pr where you are right uh, is that if I would instead sort of ask, what is the measure integration measure on uh, on the a b c? Uh, oh, sorry, this should have been in d. On, on, on the space of conjugacy classes of SL2R. So as you, as you know, uh, if I take the functions on SL2R, uh, then indeed I, I generate a measure on the space of conjugacy classes of SL2R, or, or in the space of representations, if you wish. That thing is called the Plancherelle measure. Yeah. If you take the standard uh, Plancherelle measure, it's, it's a tangent hyperbolic, which doesn't grow. Uh, if you take um, the appropriate uh, SO2R representations that are relevant to Schwarzschild and quantum mechanics, it turns that that particular measure, the space of functions on SO2R that's induced by this particular uh, setup, it's the cinch function that I had earlier on the blackboard. So the cinch is the entropy. So, thi so this is uh, w uh, one formula. It turns out that the slightly more uh, um, um, uh, exact formula is that the total density of states uh, is the cinch of 2 pi times squared of E. Uh, and this thing is indeed the, the, the what's called then the Plancherel measure on the group. Right. Uh, could you explain or comment again on the fact you said that initially when, when we think of uh, the no hair things, that's a local thing? Like when you look right. close to the black hole, you see right. that they are very... That Th that's, how people, yeah. that's how people that's how people choose yeah. uh, proof yeah. no hair theorem is by choosing a very special coordinate system mm -hmm. and, and and somehow you're the soft modes that you are mentioning are at the boundary and then you said they're not at the boundary i can i can get rid of them at the boundary too if i use diffeomorphisms at the boundary i can get rid of them at the boundary too they are basically they're they're in a, in, in my mind i can take a coordinate patch where the boundary looks standard Mm -hmm. I can take a coordinate patch where the black hole looks standard, but those coordinate patches don't. Yeah, okay. I need to have a coordinate transition function between the two. Yeah, yeah. And where I put the transition function doesn't matter. It depends on where I want to put the transition. Mm -hmm. so, it, so, the, so even though what people, the people often call the, the, the soft modes boundary gravitons, 
that's because people want to basically put them at the boundary, but it's a choice. You can you can put them anywhere in the block. But will there not be a physical effect of these soft modes that we could probe? Yes, this? there is a physical effect, and the physical effect can be seen by going from infinity to the black hole uh, uh, and by comparing the two. So I should mention, so Schwarz and quantum mechanics uh, often indeed is, is associated with, as I mentioned, ADS2. So if, an, if you take an extremal black hole, I'm not sure if that was discussed, um, a charged extremal black hole in four dimensions has a near horizon geometry that looks like ADS2, and then you have this tube that sits there. Uh, and then you have asymptotically flat space time that sits here. And then in that case, there's also basically uh, a no hair theorem that tells me that an extremal black hole has a unique metric. Asymptotically flat space time looks unique. But again, even in that case, there's also a natural diffeomorphism mode that, that allows me to have a transition function between the asymptotic symmetries of the ADS2. Uh, the asymptotic. So there's some soft mode that sits stuck here. Uh, and indeed, uh, the near horizon, uh, the, the entropy of a near horizon, sorry, of a near extremal horizon, the Nordstrom black hole, can be understood by the, by the, the just the transition functions? The transi uh, by integrating over the transition functions. Uh, and in that case, it's again the Schwarz and quantum mechanics that tells you what the volume of that particular space is. So also for near extremal black holes, part of the entropy sits here. Sorry, I'm still a bit confused about the nature of the soft mode. So, I mean, I, I mean, this is probably wrong, but so I, I so uh, the way I'm understanding that it arises from the holographic uh, uh, CFT uh, by some kind of uh, symmetry breaking at low energies. Is that right? Um, uh, basically, it arises. Uh, so so le let me still make the following comment. So, so, so indeed, if if we have um, a black hole, um, uh, when the black hole is present, um, that's actually when when the when the soft modes uh, get a non-trivial action, uh, and you can kind of see it here as well. Uh, to some extent, this beta is the temperature of the black hole, and the presence of the beta implies that the, the modes actually have a non-trivial action. So, so another way of thinking about it, perhaps, is that because of the presence of the black hole, we, we have created a reference frame, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is where the, the thermal equilibrium takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of the thermal equilibrium, uh, um, if we want to have a constant energy density, that constant energy density is only constant in one particular coordinate frame. Uh, and therefore, if I now start applying coordinate transformations on that state, then those coordinate modes become soft modes. Okay. Uh, so it's, in, it's in basically the energy density of the finite temperature system, or the energy density, or the presence of the black hole in the bulk, that breaks yeah. Uh, the diffeomorphism invariance. Okay, and so like the um, like the T's are parameterizing coordinate transformations, but so they since we have we we are have this reference frame, they become like a kind of a goldstone for uh, instead of just being a pure uh, gauge. Right? Uh, yeah, correct. Okay, uh, and it because of the presence of the reference frame, uh, they become a goldstone. That's correct, and that's how soft modes basically come about in the gravitational setting. Okay, so uh, and uh, so in this so in this box that you drew, like the the other th the other fields, the other degrees of freedom that are in the holographic CFT. Uh, so d do they decouple? The very good. Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so so as I that's, that's part of basically this this arrow that I had earlier in my diagram is that 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 how how does this particular universal physics which focuses on the gravity part, gravitational part, interplay with the other modes that might be there. Now, uh, for sure, if there's, for example, uh, a gauge field in the box, then the black hole can be charged, and then we should definitely include the gauge field and the charge of the black hole in, the, in this whole analysis. So all massless fields should certainly be, be included in this analysis. 
Um, as soon as you have sort of things that are sort of massive particles, um, then uh, they may give some corrections to this story to some extent. Although from the point of view of the CFT, one should be able to understand them really still in terms of operators in your theory. It still fits in the same framework. Uh, but certainly from the point of view of the bulk, here we're just uh, deciding to focus on the, on the piece that's gravitational. And the, the justification of this is that certainly when there's a black hole present, then most of the physics near the horizon is just purely gravitational. Um, and and that, that mirrors the fact uh, that the coarse grain properties of the spectrum are very universal and they don't care about what happens with the light particles that you have in your theory. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? <coughs> Well, uh, let's uh, thank Harman again. Thank you. And to remind you, after the coffee break, we have more questions, so you can think up more questions and exercises. And then also remember tonight at 8, there are, there's the dinner at Bovinos. You have the map um, in the email from Humberto. All right.